Welcome back to the, actually, I shouldn't say that because we actually have had a few episodes already this Friday morning because uh, uh, we are trying to get in as many candidates as possible before election day on Monday. Welcome back to a, another Friday edition of the Cross Border Interview Podcast. This afternoon, we are chatting with Calgary Board of Education, school board trustee, candidate for Ward 5 and 10, Humera Falk. Falk, Falk, sorry, I apologize for that. But thank you so much for doing this, Samarath. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much, Chris, for having me here. So uh, anyone who's ever listened to the show knows the first question out of my mouth is, where's your sense of duty to serve come from? Um, so Chris, basically, um, I am a domestic violence survivor. So since I came to Canada, I, um, I got actually I got involved with so many services because of you know these um, social services and shelters and all of that because of my situation. So, um, and if I'm sitting here today, it's because of the help and support that I got um, during those years of my life. So that's when I started to also volunteer because it was like, I wanted to really give back to the community. So I've been volunteering uh, like since uh, six, seven you know, years and, uh, um, and I volunteered with like most of the, like many agencies all across Calgary. Um, and that was also one of the reasons that I decided to enter into human services industry as well. So yeah, so it all came from my own personal experience of being a survivor, yeah. You can give back in many ways. You can give back as you've done in the past through volunteerism. You can give back to yeah. nonprofits. You can give back to businesses through your own uh, personal choice. But you in 2021, in this election on Monday, you have put your name forward for school board trustee for Ward 5 and 10. What was that yeah. ultimate decision based on? Uh, so basically, I am a community development practitioner by profession. So I have, over, like, I've been working in Ward 5 and 10 um, around capacity building and empowerment of disadvantaged communities in these two wards. And I have done a lot of work around, um, um, you know, like mental health, domestic violence, unemployment, all those issues basically that impact our ethnocultural communities as well as our disadvantaged communities. So this last year, you know, um, after the COVID, like uh, when COVID happened, I heard a, this from a lot from a lot of parents, and also I be like I my girls go to public school in War Ten as well, um, and I and I really got to know about like how dysfunctional this whole thing is right now for um, our students in Ward 5 and 10. And it was, it was for me also, it was a, it was a huge challenge on a personal level. And, uh, con and continuously throughout the year, I, I, I came across parents um, that they were having challenges uh, when it comes to like CV in terms of like navigating the system, uh, reaching out to somebody um, uh, who was, um, you know, who was there for them. So all of that. So then, uh, you know, Know, I decided that maybe because I have always advocated uh, and I've been a very strong voice for issues that impact our communities. So maybe this is something that, you know, I could totally do. And um, so that was one of the reasons that I, uh, I felt that there is like at CB level, we lack the voice of these two, uh, um, you know, awards. So maybe I could use my work experience as well as my experience as a parent um, of girls going attending CB system. So that's why I decided to do this. Yeah. Now, you, you mentioned diversity, which is, uh, I would say, and I, I've heard it a lot from a lot of candidates from a lot of per different parts of this, uh, uh, the uh, city, but I would say 5 and 10, Ward 5 and 10, are probably one of the most diverse communities yeah. in the city. Um, traditionally, uh, English is the first spoken language in the Calgary yes. Board of Education, but there is multi, multi languages used in the family homes. How do you best uh, prepare to run a campaign to be the voice of so many different cultures, backgrounds and ethnicities if elected on Monday? If elected on Monday? Yeah. Um, so just wanted to um, like let you know, I'm sure that you know that we have over um, uh, 240 ethnicities in Calgary, right? And even like in my day-to-day -day experience working with these communities, I know there's so many languages that I personally have never even heard of, right? And there's a huge chunk of population that is falling through cracks just because of the language barrier and just because of the cultural barriers. And you know, because lack of training uh, that, you know, as, as staff in every agency has regarding 
uh, the understanding of different cultures and you know all of that cultural competency piece that comes in so I think yes yeah, so uh, for me like um, you know I feel that because I've already worked with so many communities I do understand this cultural competency part like really well and I have uh, I have closely worked with these community leaders and community members representing you know different different communities so I'm already extremely embedded in these communities so I understand their needs I I not only understand but I also share the concerns so I I feel that if I'm elected um, and community engagement is a big piece uh, and it should be a big, uh, you know, uh, part for, of, of um, uh, role, for, um, you know, the trustees should be doing a lot of community engagement and parents involvement, uh, you know, in policies that affect their kids' education. So I, because I'm already doing this, so I think that is something that I would be continuing to do on a regular basis because I already have that relationship established with parents uh, in these two wards. So yeah, so I already have the groundwork done. So I feel that, you know, uh, if, I, if I'm elected, I could totally represent their voices or their concerns at CB table. Because so also- you, um, oh, Continue uh, on. Yeah. No, continue uh, on, And sorry. also, yes, uh, because, you know, like this is the ward of the most, um, uh, and like these two words are the most hardworking people, right? And it's just not that one issue, uh, it's not the if children are only struggling with, let's say English language, though they are more like, are, I think 30% or so population of students are ELL learners, right? So they need those supports, in-house supports um, uh, regarding language. But also, you know, if you look at it um, with the intersectional lens, for example, if parents are struggling with uh, mental health issues or unemployment issues, poverty, that does impact kids' education as well, right? So we need to have that holistic lens, or I always say that intersectional lens while dealing with uh, such issues, even at school level, right? So we need to have those equitable resources or supports available for these students so nobody feels left out because, you know, we, you know that C at CB, like everybody should feel welcomed and, you know, this is where every child gets an equal opportunity. So, yeah, so for me, I think, uh, yeah, so so that's where it is. I, I know the issues already. I, I obviously, I can I can learn more as I go, but um, I feel that I can truly represent uh, uh, these communities living in World 5 and 10. So I've got to ask the question because you kept on saying the concerns that you're hearing from the parents of Ward 5 and 10. What are those concerns? Because I talk to my family members and they live in Temple and they live in Whitehorn and they live uh, in Rundle. So th these are people that you, they will be voting for you. And their concerns might not be what you're hearing. So I want to know from you, what are you hearing from the parents of kids at the school system in Calgary right now? One of the things that like I have heard repeatedly, and I know that's provincial government thing, but still as a trustee, I could totally advocate and fight um, on that is like the proposed curriculum, right? So parents are deeply concerned about that proposed curriculum, even if they do not full, because I am not a curriculum expert, but even if parents do not understand, but they still know that it's very, it's very Eurocentric, right? It does not teach the, uh, it does not teach respect for diversity or tolerance for other religion. And even it's not, you know, that it's not developmentally appropriate according to what, you know, uh, curriculum experts and education experts have said. So that's one of the biggest concerns that I have recently uh, heard from parents. Other than that, you know, like I live in Skyview and I have to go to Temple to drop off my daughters, right? We do not have schools in these areas. And these are growing communities like Redstone, Savannah, Skyview. Even the bus stops are not very close to homes. And for somebody like myself, who is a, a you know, I am not a high income I and I am not a low income either. So that means I have to pay for the bus service and it's an added burden because single parents an added burden on my finances, right? So there has to be a solution around this. We need these schools built as fast as, you know, uh, we could. And then, you know, like Nelson Mandela High School, I don't know how familiar you are with that, but the, the dropout rate is like extremely high. Classes are totally overcrowded. We do not have resources, even they're not, lockers are not, you know, uh, available for each student. And also, you know, the incidence of like racism and, you know, the drugs and all of that. We need another high school. And I know that they've approved the land in Cornerstone, but we really need 
to push for funding for that school as well, so that at least we could have, you know, um, uh, we, we could cap class sizes and, you know, uh, we could provide those services or support to students that they need. So these are the two major concerns that I have, like transportation, lack of schools, uh, you know, the, the, the curriculum. And again, the, the mental health is a huge issue that I've been hearing now. And more so because I, I myself has experienced uh, and I know how challenging it was for my kids. Um, so uh, I know that it's a it's a huge issue right now. So we need to make sure um, and uh, that we push for that. We push for having mental health support or counselor available in each school uh, moving forward because that's what parents are or you know uh, children need the most right now. So I'm going to ask about the curriculum because that seems to be the hot topic that everyone seems to bring, be bringing up who yeah. runs in your position is that curriculum. In your opinion, in your view, I want to know your opinion and your views on this. What is wrong with the curriculum that was proposed by the provincial government as is today? What is the biggest issue you find? Actually, okay, so yeah, as I said, I'm not a curriculum expert, but whatever I have understood and read about it, and you know, the recently the Alberta Teachers Association released that report as well. So for me, uh, the social studies part is a bit concerning because uh, being a community development practitioner, I, I know that how, uh, you know, big of a big of an issue this racism is, and it it is it, it exists all across, right? So we need to, and we, and I think we somehow we lay the foundation somewhere at a very basic level, right? So if you're not teaching respect for diversity or um, you know the the contribution of other uh, you know cultures or the history uh, properly, then obviously we cannot claim that we could eliminate racism or you know at a at a you know bigger level so we uh, so that's their indigenous um, uh, indigenous um, as a history is not taught um, until grade fourth, right? So, which I feel like it's not right. Also, like what I've heard from maths, um, you know, um, my my friend teachers who, are, who teach maths, that it's very it's 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 based on like rote memorization rather than preparing students, you know, for critical thinking and all of that. So instead of taking it them forward, it's going to take them backwards if we pilot this 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 curriculum, right? So I think there are these kind of things, and I'm sure there there are a lot more things. There's a they. they also claim that it's plagiarized and all of that so we need to uh, you know i think get back to the drawing board making sure that all stakeholders and experts are involved when we actually when we actually release the the final draft right because it's it's a huge concern and for a parent like myself it is a concern for me as well so yeah one and i appreciate you talking about that because uh, it is something that a lot of people are going to be looking at in for at the next school board trustees to vote on or potentially advocate against if elected mm -hmm. so i appreciate you being willing to chat about that i want to take a moment right now and this is the big elephant in the room because i think a lot of people are it's on their minds and there's a there's a large vocal minority who are who are yelling at the schools and saying the mask mandate that was imposed by the school board, <laughs> you're laughing and you know where the question's gonna go. And I, I wanna get you on record because it is a topic that I hear in my neighborhood. I talk to my neighbors and that's what they talk about is I don't want my kids going to school with a mask or I do want my kids going to school with a mask. So where do you stand on the position of masks in the school system right now? Because in August, the current school board trustees voted to keep uh, put implement a mask mandate for this school year. You're going to have to pick that up if elected on Monday. Where do you stand on the issue? For sure. So uh, Chris, actually safety is definitely one of the biggest priority for me as well. Being a parent, right? I do not have a family where, you know, my, if something happens to my kids or myself, we can put that on. So it is also uh, one of my biggest, on the personal level, my biggest concern as well. I'm not a health expert, right? And school trustees are not health experts either, not a school board as a whole, right? So the thing is that it, we, we totally rely on provincial government expertise or the health expert expertise in this, right? So it, if they feel that it it has it should be mandated, I know it 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 is an inconvenience for so many parents, and I totally agree with that part as well. But then we need to do what is best for you know the for everyone, right? So I personally, if it's coming from health officials and health experts, obviously, and if if the provincial government wants us to do it, 
like you know i think i would definitely want to do it as well because it's about everybody's safety and i'm very clear about that but i also do believe that we need we should have um, we should engage as i said that we should engage communities and parents and have their input as well just to see uh what a majority is thinking or the min- if minority is there what are their concerns around it but at the end of the day i think it should be something that the health experts um uh, uh, should decide and the provincial government yeah Perfect. Uh, the reason I say that is because you, you touched on the word that I'm going to talk about now, and that's engagement. Engagement can be a double-edged sword because you can go talk to everyone in Skyview, you can go talk to everyone in Temple, and they will give you a different opinion on a different issue, and they will give you 10,000 opinions if you talk to 10,000 people in your in Ward 5 and 10. How do you balance mm-hmm. that? How do you balance what you're hearing to the vote because you are there to represent us and you are going to hear a wide variety of opinions on different things. So engagement is good, but how do you engage with people who may have different opinions than you and you will have to represent them? For sure, you know, like coming from a research uh, background when I talk about like engagement, it's just not only having conversations with them, um, open conversations, it also involves gathering data, right? So it means that we need to do engagement in a proper way or consultation in a proper way, meaning that we need to, uh, it should be based on like, you know, needs assessment and gap identification, um, and then, you know, uh, uh, putting it forward. So for me, it would be more like, I totally agree, community engagement is definitely a double-edged sword and you need to strike that balance. And it's it's not just in this case, but, you know, in my work generally. Um, so we need, and, and we should also, when we do that, we have to have this open mind that we would never, uh, you know, like, everybody's not gonna agree on everything, right? So there will always be some disagreement. Uh, but again, it all depends on what are the major concerns and it can only come up if, if, if we carry out a research or the engagement or consultations in a proper way, right? In a more systemic way. And then when we have that solid data, we could totally present it at the, at the CB t- uh, table or to the government, right? So, um, but you know, like I, I still feel that there, there are always ways, like if you engage them, at least if they feel that their voices are heard, that would make a difference. Right now, what's happening is, Chris, um, especially like in Ward Five, I can, I can, I can totally say because I live in Ward Five as well. People do not know what trustees do. People do not know their current trustee. They, they have actually some of them have not even heard of that. If there, there are any trustees, they could reach out to, right? So there are so many barriers already there. So through, throughout my campaign, this was one of the major. Uh, challenge for me as to I had to explain to them that you know there is this board that sits and this is the role of the trustees right all of that but if they know that at least there is somebody who is there they could reach out to they could talk to right I know that is like you know where we would at least start removing or dismantling some of the barriers that prevent them from you know reaching out to or you know um, so yeah so we we have to start somewhere right so I would want to start from the very basics where I would want to create opportunities to parents and communities to come together talk about their concerns they, they they may not agree on everything but at least they're getting those opportunities to discuss and trust me I I, I believe that that would actually uh, make so many uh, misconceptions and misunderstandings go away right and then obviously we could you know yeah so just just starting is the for me it's it's important that's it's good to hear I, I want to touch on another subject that you brought up and I, I like when people give more details than I I ask for because it gives me the ability to ask follow-up questions. And the follow-up question is this, you you talked about mental health in the school system. You talked about how kids are struggling right now. How, as a school board trustee, can you help students with their mental health? Because you talked about you need to look at the provincial government for the health mandates. Should we not be looking at the provincial government to bring in counselors or uh, people who can better suit uh, the needs of the students? How So how can you, as a school board trustee for Fort Ward 5 and 10, help the mental health of our students? Um, you know that cutbacks has already impacted you know the services 
or supports that were available for students before, right? So obviously that's one of the, uh, you know, things that we, we really need to, uh, uh, you know, advocate for. But what I want to say is that I think we need to strongly, strongly advocate for mental health supports and counselors. Um, just so you know, like, you know, we know that we do not have a lot of funding now and even, uh, you know, the CB reserves like we do not have uh, that funding that we could have mental health um, person hired for each school. Um, so yeah, we but 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 we need to we need to push um, you know um, uh, for for this because if we do not if you're not gonna do this, it's gonna get like things are not gonna get better and this should be our priority. How we do that, I don't know. It's a board like we sit at the table, we we discuss. We have to have you know different options. I know that um, I was just um, uh, looking at it that I know that we have about like 16 full-time kindergarten, uh, you know, uh, uh, for, for yeah, for full-day kindergarten um, uh, under CBE, but government funds only half a day kindergarten, right? So so, many, so much of our money of, from funds go to uh, uh, finance that, right? If, if we were getting even that money from provincial government, then we could use our reserve money to appoint mental health support or, you know, uh, with um, uh, in-house support for um, for our students. So by partnering with like AHS, right? We need to look at that uh, by partnering with relevant government agencies uh, because it's not that we could ask parents or, um, uh, or you know, to drive their kids around uh, take them to different therapies. Those those services should be available in schools, right? One other thing um, that I was thinking that sometimes, you know, like, because our hiring practices at CB level should also reflect the, you know, our uh, uh, diverse student base, uh, but it does not, unfortunately. Um, and I think if we have that disaggregated data where we could actually also look into hiring teachers in accordance with the existing population, you know, for students at CBE, you know, when when students have those teachers they could somehow relate to or from the same cultural backgrounds, that is also very comforting at many levels, right? Or the staff if they're if they're familiar faces, right? So they could there they could be different options we could look at it, but I think yes, mental health support has to be there. Like there is no like ifs and buts. We should as trustees we should advocate for having mental health supports and counselor available in schools. Yes. And I appreciate that. Um, we we're about 25 minutes into the interview, and I just want to make sure that I have enough time before uh, to follow up with some last minute questions. Um, so I want to turn to the future now. So on October 19th, you are officially elected. You are the trustee elect for Ward 5 and 10 for the school uh, for the Calgary Board of Education. I want to know, and I ask this to all my candidates, because that way in 100 days, I can follow up with you on this show and say, did you do it? What would be priority number one on October 19th for you if you are the successful candidate on October 18th? Yeah, for sure. So I think uh, for me, um, so there are like two things, right? <laughs> so for me, I would really want to, because this also ties into mental health as well, because so many communities have repeatedly, uh, you know, um, like shared this concern of racism and, you know, kids being bullied at school. So I know that Calgary Cares Committee, uh, CB was the first, uh, one of the first board who actually uh, formed this anti-racism task force, right? So I just really want to see where the recommendations are, if there are any recommendations and how we could actually implement those recommendations. Also, I think uh, we would we, we should really look into um, hiring an indigenous trustee on the board if we are really serious about working towards uh, or achieving reconciliation. Uh, and under the Education Act, uh, CB can totally do that. So this is one of the, I think, uh, topmost priorities for me, it's mental health and um, you know, uh, pushing to hire an indigenous trustee so that the support is provided to indigenous um, students uh, that they really need at this moment. And we do not have those um, that adequate lands to do that for them. So these two things along with the, you know, we need schools, more schools in, in Ward 5 and 10 for our growing communities, for sure, yeah. Actually, there are a lot of priorities. I don't know the budget cuts. I, I, I was afraid to so, say, wow, you, you got a busy first day ahead of you if that's what you're so, going to be doing. Yeah. Um, but I so want to, but politicians usually get um, the most accomplished within their, their first hundred days. They learn the ropes. They try to start advocating for what they want. 
Uh, as a businessman myself, I know that you have to put in metrics to ensure that you are successful. You need to be able to say, I've got X accomplished by a, this date. I've got this accomplished by this date. I've got this accomplished by this date. So the first 100 days is going to be a big priority for you because it's budget. You're going to have, uh, you're going to have uh, schools Christmas. You're going to have COVID-19 you're going to be looking at. You're going to have anti-racism things you're going to be looking at. You're going to be advocating for the school. What are the big metrics that you're going to put in place that you can go back to the voters in 100 days from October 19th? So that's February. And say to the people, I've started on this file, this file, and this file. And I've got this done, this done, and this done. What are the things that you're going to put in place for yourself to ensure that you are a successful trustee? I think definitely if I bring in the, if I bring any motion and that's being accepted, right? And the policies are implemented as a result of that, that's definitely, that would be uh, one of my, uh, you know, uh, uh, matrix for success. Also, as I said, like community engagement, right? If I am regularly reaching out to people on the ground, be it like through schools or community associations, which I am going to do because I'm really passionate about that. So that would be something if people, are familiar with me, they can reach out to me directly. I think that itself is a success that they're able to talk to me directly without any barriers in between. Um, so I will be doing a lot of community consultations online, you know, also, um, you know, on ground. Uh, so that would be one thing uh, uh, for me as well. And also, and you would know, like I would be, you would see me a lot. That's a promise, like in advocating, like going to like talking to government officials, like, yeah. So I will be doing a lot of that work. So hopefully my work after three years would speak for itself. And it's not that I'm making empty promises, but because when I, I know that when I had nothing and very limited resources, I was still a very strong voice for, uh, you know, women uh, suffering from domestic abuse and people going through mental health issues. And now if I have those, uh, you know, that voice and I have that platform, I know that I, 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 I could potentially do a lot for uh, people who need this right now. So, yeah. I appreciate that. Um, Amara, take a few minutes. Uh, talk to the people of Ward 5 and 10. Talk to the people directly, people who are listening, people who are thinking about voting for you, and tell them why you should be the next uh, school board trustee for the Calgary Board of Education for the wards of 5 and 10. Whenever you're ready, go ahead. Okay, for sure. Yes. So... <clears throat> I, I, I am counting on your support and I feel that I am the right candidate because I am extremely passionate about public education. I believe in public education because I truly believe that this is where we lay the foundation of a true democratic society. And this is where everybody should feel welcomed. Every child gets an equal opportunity to have a successful uh, life ahead. So I am a right candidate because I have, um, uh, the relevant work experience. I have always lived in these two wards. I've worked in these two wards. I'm deeply, deeply embedded in these two communities. I have always been a very strong advocate for these communities. Uh, also, I understand these issues. If as, if for, as a parent, if I want best for my children, as trustee, I will want best for every child who is walking through Calgary Board of Education door. And I'm, I'm, I promise you that I won't let you down. So I think I need to, I deserve that chance and I would be grateful if you trust me this time. Yeah. Awesome. I wanna thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honor and a pleasure. And I wish you all the best on Monday because I know the last 10 months has been a roller coaster and I know. It yeah. has been a the longest election I've ever had to cover or even talk about, but I wish you the best because we need people like you. You sound like someone who is a passionate person and who believes that what they're doing is right. And it sounds like you are sincere with your answers. So I wish you all the best on October 18th on Monday. Um, to my listeners and to my voters, to my viewers, not voters, but to the voters of Calgary, I'm going to say this and I'm going to say this one more time for those who haven't heard it and should hear it. Get out and vote. Vote, vote, vote. If you do not vote, you do not have a voice. Get out on Monday. Advanced voting or is done. And voting day is Monday, 8 to 8, I believe it is, if I'm not mistaken. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yep. Um, and vote. Vote, 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 vote. Vote and don't <laughs> complain if you don't. <laughs> um, Humera, thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honor and a pleasure. 
Thank you so much, Professor. I'm like, I feel totally humbled and honored that you gave me this opportunity to share my platform with uh, your audience. But yeah, I hope to earn your trust and your audience trust as well. So thank you.